Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to do a teardown inspection on a TH350C. Um, I have a uh, quick teardown video on one of these. This is obviously not the same unit, um, but that video really doesn't get into any detail. It's just a fast forward motion of me taking apart a TH350 and it's largely worthless. So we're going to do a full length teardown and kind of walk you through all the different points of inspection, common drivability issues and symptoms along with their associated causes uh, in the transmission as we move through it. And then I'll also discuss uh, to some extent all the different changes and variations between the two primary variants, the 350 versus the 350C, and discuss interchangeability to some extent. Now I have a lot of topical videos on the TH350 so I won't delve too much into detail on any one area. Um, if I already have a video on it you can check those videos out for example you know there's a lot of things to know about the the uh, pumps between the 350 and 350C and I have a you know roughly 20 or 25 minute video on that so you can check that out. Um, you know likewise for some other areas uh, within the transmission. So uh, I'll go through general inspection procedures give you some tips and tricks and things to look out for when you're um, you know moving through the unit on teardown so that you can better understand or diagnose and get to the bottom of why the unit failed in the first place or if you're just doing a preventative um, you know or proactive rebuild where there's nothing really wrong with the unit you're just wanting to refresh it uh, you can identify things that may be problematic that haven't yet appeared symptomatically you know while you were driving the vehicle on the road so we'll get into that and then um, once I'm done uh, I'm gonna clean all the parts up and then I'll do a separate video on uh, converting a TH350C to a non-locking variant. As you can see in the uh, upper left-hand corner, I have a uh, input drum and a pump assembly from a non-locking TH350, and you know we'll kind of use that those for visual reference so that we can compare and contrast uh, the two variations. Now I get into that to some extent with my um, TH350 build on the budget, but I'm you know still getting some questions on it, and there's you know you know when I finally get to that portion of the video it's like you know last minute I think it's the last four or five minutes where I really discuss it so um, I'll give it some more thorough treatment in a standalone video so that you can kind of see exactly what's done and uh, I'm gonna assemble uh, this unit back again and when I get to the point where um, ready to install the drum and the pump I'll actually go through and take you um, you know on a step-by-step -step kind of procedural journey uh, uh, showing you exactly how to convert a um, TH350C to a non-locking TH350 using all of the case parts here along with the different things you have to do to make that happen. Alright, so let me reposition the camera and we'll begin. Alright, as with all transmissions on the bench, you want to do a very thorough uh, inspection on the outside of the unit. And if your transmission is caked in grime and dirt and grease and, you know, literally covered the entire case with it, like this one was, I would strongly recommend that you pressure wash the case before you start the teardown inspection. And the reason for that is so that you can discover things like this. So, let me see if I can zoom in real quick. So you notice here there's a small hairline fracture uh, that I actually did not catch when I was, um, you know, initially took this thing in and just gave it a look-see real quick because it was covered in dirt and grime. And while this is not debilitating, I mean, this can be easily weld repaired, you know, I'd prefer TIG welding it. Um, it is something that you want to catch sooner rather than later, especially if it's transmission that you're going to be rebuilding and putting back on the road, you know, sooner rather than later. Uh, one thing you want to do if you see something like this, uh, and it's this is the only defect, there's no other cracks or anything like that, is take a maybe a hundred to a hundred ten thousandths drill bit and drill a hole right through the case here at the uh, you know terminus of the crack or the origin point of the crack so that it doesn't get any worse and then from there you can go about weld repairing it and one thing I like to do is I'll have an engine block and I will actually bolt this to the engine block you know the empty case and then I'll gradually weld you know you know little by little incrementally so as to not introduce too much heat while it's on the block the reason I like to do that is so that I can be sure that, um, you know, with the amount of heat introduced and aluminum being real sensitive to heat, that I know it will bolt up to the, um, uh, to the engine when it's, you know, time to reinstall it. If a transmission comes in and, you know, the owner or whomever tells you that 
the uh, engine overheated real bad or the transmission overheated real bad, uh, one of the things you want to do is, you know, when you empty it, clean up the case, have the customer come back and take the empty case with them and see if it will still bolt up to the engine. If it won't, then, you know, you have a warped case and you want to find that out, you know, while everything's all apart. I uh, had that happen to me with a C6 and the guy had a cracked cylinder head and, and you know the engine way overheated transmission way overheated and I gave him the empty case back and I told him hey go and see if this thing will bolt up to your um, you know to your engine and sure enough when he uh, tried to bolt the empty case to it it, it would not bolt um, it's going to be either the left side or the right side but you know one of them is going to kind of you know just simply not mate fully and flush and you know you have a warped bell and that's I don't, I don't want to say it's common like I don't want to cause any panic but at the same token it is not as rare as you might think all right so that's my spiel there um, the other thing I'll point out when it comes to crack cases, uh, you're not going to see this too much in hot weather, but you might in cold weather. You know, cold weather climates and you know where temperatures get below freezing uh, for a good part of the winter. If you see cracks back here in the case, okay, here, along here, especially in this area right here, then um, what you may suspect is water getting into uh, the modulator circuit and freezing. And when that happens, line pressure spikes to something like six, seven hundred, eight hundred psi, and that will crack the case, um, you know, quite readily. So if you see a, a crack case like this come in, then you may want to ask the, uh, you know, the owner if the vehicle's been, um, you know, subjected to sub-freezing temperatures and maybe water got in there. All right, the other things you want to look for are things like this. All right, and what I mean by this is RTV. If you see a lot of RTV on the transmission like this, you can you know kind of surmise one of two things: uh, either whoever serviced the transmission, maybe they put a filter on it, and you know, maybe they were trying to diagnose a problem. But either way, when they put the pan back on, you know they, they did not understand that you should never use RTV, and that's maybe a practice that they had, and that's what they do. Uh, or they put the pan back on and the pan was leaking and they torqued everything to spec all the bolts to like you know 98 or 110 or you know 120 inch pounds and no matter what they did it leaked so they decided to um, deal with it via RTV. Uh, if that happens to you then know that the pan is warped and the, the sealing surface on the pan rail is just simply not going to seal and you want to replace the pan. Um, and I always recommend whenever possible if you have the ground clearance for it just put a deep pan with a drain plug on it. Uh, these factory pans I mean I guess they're okay for you know normal use but even for trucks or anything with a stock V8 you know whether it be a small block or big block um, cooling capacity is going to be, you know, uh, you know, uh, critically important regardless. And um, aluminum dissipates heat a lot better than uh, stamped sheet metal. And the transmission, all other things equal, will live longer. All right. Uh, the other thing to really look at is the governor cover. All right. If that governor cover is dented in any way. It needs to be replaced. Uh, if you notice here, it's got this, uh, you know, a little indentation. What this is, is it's a, a little um, travel stop. Uh, the governor has to move inward like this, uh, you know, a certain amount of uh, distance to allow it to spin freely. Uh, that's designed into, um, you know, this whole governor area here. If this is dented in any way and this is caved in, then you're going to have a bind up with the governor, potentially anyway, and you're going to have all kind of shifting problems. So uh, if you see this, then just simply replace the cover. All right, easy way to tell the TH350 and TH350C apart, and this applies to the uh, TH250 and 250C as well, is just look for a case connector here on the driver's side. If you see it, then you know you're working with a TH350C. Uh, if the transmission's out, maybe you're in a junkyard or you know, um, you know, you're at a uh, place where cores can be purchased. Uh, if you notice that your input shaft looks like this, you know, just like a 700R4, and it's got an O-ring on it, then you obviously you know you're working with a uh, TH350C. All right, uh, you'll notice that the bell housing, the bolt pattern here, is a dual bolt pattern. So here, this transmission can be mated to a um, Buick Oldsmobile or Pontiac engine, but it can also be mated to a Chevrolet small or big block engine. So you got provisions for both. Okay, so you got the, uh, you know, kind of triangle up here, and then of course you got the two ears for the BOP, and then you got all the different requisite bolt holes 
and you can put it to any engine. So um, I don't know how common or not common these are. I mean, the TH350C came with all three different bolt patterns and same with the TH350. Um, but if you're looking for cores, uh, these are going to be real desirable relative to the other two because of the versatility. All right, and then like all uh, transmissions where you measure in play uh, via the input shaft traveling, you know, um, back and forth, you want to take it, pull on it, push on it, make sure you got in play. In play for these is to be between 10 and 45 thousandths. Most of them are relatively sloppy. Uh, some of them come in with like 50, 60, 70 thousandths even I've seen. And, you know, no big deal. Uh, you just know to correct it on overhaul. Uh, especially if you're doing high performance, you want that toward the lower end of the range. You want the case nice and tight, but still enough, um, you know, travel so that it can move. So between 10 and 20 thousandths is like a good range to shoot for. Okay, on the outside, um, you have your main line pressure uh, tap here, 7 16 And then you have your 1-2 pressure port and your 2-3 pressure port. Um, these are nice to have because you can measure your main line pressure once you, um, you know, overhaul the unit and put it back in the vehicle. So you can validate everything is good. Pump is working. You know, it's generating pressure. The uh, PR and boost valves, uh, you know, that valve train and the valve body is working. No problems. Um, then you can also test your 1-2 and your 2-3, especially if you're having issues shifting. Uh, if you have real soft shifts 1-2 or 2-3, um, you can test pressure in each of these circuits to isolate and confirm or deny that you have a line pressure problem there. And if so, then you know, you'll have to figure out why that is. Um, and it's usually because either lip seals are you know, hardened and not sealing in the drum, or you have sealing rings on the pump stator that are, again, worn out, not sealing, etc. I mean, those are the, for anything that hasn't been freshly overhauled, that is the most common um, you know, two reasons why you might have problems. And I guess same with the one too, but it's more common to have issues with the you know, high clutch. Okay, vacuum modulator. Um, very early TH350s uh, had a very large, I guess, can style modulator and they were black. Uh, they were not adjustable. I mean, they technically were, but uh, the factory would spot weld them. Uh, and I believe in 75, they moved to a smaller modulator and modulators that you can buy uh, off the shelf are gonna be, you know, the usual kind of gold colored and they will have a broad range of adjustment. So, um, I could do a whole video on the modulator system, uh, and if there's an appetite for that, uh, I'll do that. But suffice to say, I'll just point out, you know, three common problems with these things. Um, most common problem is no uh, one-two upshift. The modulator kind of regulates and controls your part throttle upshifts. Once you go wide open, or at least more than say 40 or 50 percent, then it's all governor. But if you have a problem with the modulator, um, you know, one thing you can do is uh, take the vehicle out on the road, let's just say you have no one-two upshift, take it out on the road, punch it to like 30 or 40 miles an hour, and then throw it into manual low, and then throw it right back into drive. If you have a one-two upshift at that point, then you can, you know, 90% sure your problem is the modulator. Um, it could be valve body and it could be governor. Uh, I like to refer to those three things as like the triumvirate of trouble because all your shifting and drivability symptoms as it relates to either, you know, late shifts, uh, early shifts, harsh shifts, um, problems up shifting, problems down shifting, they're all going to be sourced, chances are anyway, they're all going to be sourced in uh, one of those three um, systems. So, you know, like I say, that, that, that's the triumvirate of trouble. And that is true for all of these transmissions. Uh, that take a vacuum modulator. Now there's two types of modulators that you should be familiar with. Um, there is, of course, the vacuum style modulator that's pretty much universal. Um, and then for engines uh, that are, you know, uh, geared toward extremely high performance, uh, especially engines that are either equipped with a turbo or a supercharger or nitrous or some other power adder, you may or may not be able to run a traditional vacuum modulator on your transmission, you may need to go to a mechanical modulator. A mechanical modulator essentially performs the same functions as the vacuum modulator, but it's not dependent on vacuum. It's, you know, it's mechanical. And that's because in a, um, you know, let's just say you have a cam that ha has a ton of duration and or, uh, you know, not a lot of overlap, then you're not going to generate enough vacuum to actually properly run this thing. I mean, it's going to take about anywhere from 12 to 15 inches of lift um, to properly function. 
And if there's just no way you can generate that at idle, then you know, you're gonna need to resort to a uh, mechanical modulator. And same with those that are running turbo or nitrous or whatever, uh, they're going to need to resort to a mechanical modulator or a external vacuum pump. And I think diesels, um, I've never done a diesel TH350, but I believe the diesels uh, also come equipped with a, um, you know, a, uh, an auxiliary vacuum pump of sorts to make up for, among other things, um, you know, lack of vacuum for braking and, of course, lack of vacuum for uh, operating the transmission. All right, so half inch to remove the modulator. We'll take that off first. All right, when you take these off, if you're having issues with the modulator, pull it out, inspect the O-ring. If the O-ring is hardened, then obviously you need to replace it. That can happen. And then another thing, um, you wanna take a pencil magnet, and what you wanna do is go in there and see if you could pull the modulator out with the pencil magnet, okay? So, This one's dragging a little bit. Okay, if it's dragging like this, then you're gonna to wanna to take something called a bench buddy and polish that bore. So an example of a bench buddy is this, and you've seen me use these if you watched any of my valve body um, you know, overhaul videos or any transmission that I've you know, featured on the channel, then um, you see me use bench buddies. And what they are are basically little tiny uh, hones that take just a very, very slight amount of material off and you know just enough to polish the bore. Uh, the other thing you could do is just chuck this thing up into a drill and use something like six or 800 grit sandpaper. And then just for a short while, uh, polish the lands themselves. You don't wanna to get too aggressive with it, but uh, a little bit of polishing can you know fix or you know repair any issues associated with this thing. And like I said, if it's dragging like this one is, then you're gonna have drivability symptoms. So this is the orientation, goes in like that. All right, next thing I'll deal with is the one two accumulator. So the accumulator consists of a snap ring, a cover, an accumulator spring or return spring and a piston. So if you have a real late harsh 1-2 upshift and you've managed to uh, you know, either rule out or um, you know, confirm that it's not governor, it's not modulator, it's not valve body, or you just simply check this and you found the spring to be broken, then you know, that's kind of your answer. So just take a punch so that you can get that thing out of its groove. and then just pry out on it, and then it'll come out. And then just grab some, you know, large pliers, and then carefully pull it out. You'll notice there's an O-ring Obviously, you'll replace that on overhaul, but you want to inspect the O-ring. This one is rock hard. So, I mean, I have no idea what this thing looks like on the inside yet, but uh, that would have definitely leaked if I tried to install this transmission and, you know, run it. All right, make sure you inspect the cover too. Make sure it's not bent, dented, warped, or otherwise damaged. If it is, just replace it. This spring's in good shape, but I would recommend you replace it anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's broken or not broken. Uh, the, you know, instances of one-two accumulator springs breaking are common enough, at least from what I've seen, that I would recommend that you just proactively replace it on overhaul. All right, and then the piston here. I'm just using some snap ring pliers. Okay, if you have slipping from one to two, 
you can suspect that these O-rings here, or these ceiling rings rather, they're not um, rubber, they're Teflon, are shot. Uh, there are, I believe there's some manuals that actually tell you not to replace them unless they're damaged. Uh, at least I've seen that guidance either with these or you know, TH400, I mean, I'm not exactly sure where. Um, but irrespective, it doesn't matter, disregard that guidance, it's not valid. Um, always replace the Teflon ceiling rings on these 1-2 accumulator pistons, no matter what transmission you're working on. Okay, next, inspect the bore. So, if you're trying to diagnose a problem with the, um, you know, with a 1-2 slip, okay, consider that the bore may be the source of the problem. Um, they make case savers for these so that, you know, if the bore is excessively worn or scratched or, you know, scored up, whatever, you can install case saver and that will uh, restore the condition to like new and you won't have any problems anymore. All right, next thing, while I'm, you know, have the transmission oriented, uh, grab your little kick down um, valve lever here for your kick down cable and pull on it. Make sure that it returns, you know, um, consistently back to a rest position. You can feel the valve moving in and out. If there is issues with your kick down system, then you're, you're going to have very, very late upshifts if you have them at all. If that valve is binding, then you will not have any sort of upshift, um, either one, two, or especially uh, two to three, or it'll occur like, I don't know, near the red line when obviously that's not when it's supposed to happen. I have separate videos on the valve body, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it once we get to it, but um, just know that valve body is uh, a source for a lot of drivability problems and symptoms, and uh, you know, you'll need to deal with it <clears throat> if that, you know, if that happens or if you, know, you determine the valve body is the source of your issues. Okay, speedometer. This one's like broken off or whatever. Let me pull it out. Okay, at some point I will annotate the video. I'm not exactly sure when. Um, they uh, transitioned away from like the small, um, roughly 7 8 diameter bullet looking um, speedometer setups to these uh, larger um, 2 inch diameter deals where uh, they carried that forward into the 700R4s. All right, when it comes to the speedometer, I mean, it's you know pretty straightforward deal to inspect these. You're looking for stuff like this. Uh, obviously, if it's broken, you replace it. Um, you also want to examine the teeth, make sure that they're not heavily worn out or you know some partially or totally stripped. Uh, housings are cheap. You can replace them on overhaul. So, um, and then uh, as far as uh, the bore itself, just like the um, accumulator bore, you want to double check, make sure that the bore is not worn. If you have consistent leaks in this area, then, um, you know, you feel like you have to resort to RTV, you just probably, I guess I would recommend you just simply replace the extension housing. And then speaking of the extension housing, there's three different lengths of housing um, installed on these, just depending on, you know, application and, you know, model and all that. Uh, there's this one, the shortest one, this is roughly six inches, then they had a nine inch version, and then there was a uh, foot long version uh, that went into, you know, some of the real long, long wheelbase vehicles. And I'll annotate the video um, with some examples, but, uh, you know, just, that's kind of the deal there. All right. Nine sixteenths on your extension housing two case bolts. So keep two of these aside because you're going to need them to take the pump out. You're going to use that in conjunction with a slide hammer, unless you have a slide hammer uh, where the end of it is already threaded three eighths by sixteen. Then you can just thread that into the pump in the locations where I'll show you to remove the pump.
Okay, extension housing. Um, it's probably a good idea to take the seal off. Uh, like I said, this is a core, so I mean, I'm not gonna mess with it for now, but you can take that seal off while it's still mounted to the transmission. All right, again, same deal. You know, if you have problems of leaking, this is probably rock hard. This one is kind of intermediate. I mean, it's still somewhat supple, but you know, it would have started leaking before long. Okay, this is in part. Okay, so one thing you want to do with the output shaft is spin it. Okay, and you can do this before you take it out, obviously. Spin it in both the direction engine rotation as well as the opposite direction. Okay, if when you're spinning this thing in the opposite direction engine rotation and it's binding up or it feels like, you know, really difficult to turn, um, then I would suspect that you may actually have a warped or um, tweaked case. Uh, it's not common uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but I've seen it, I don't know, maybe a handful of times, less than 10. But uh, if the case is warped, it's because either the engine overheated uh, multiple times significantly or the trans overheated or both. Um, and that's where you're gonna encounter that kind of problem. Uh, otherwise, it should spin you know, relatively freely. It's gonna take more effort to turn the engine uh, against engine rotation than in, you know, in the same direction. So if you're going clockwise in this case, um, you know, and you're holding at the rear of the transmission, it's gonna be about three times harder to turn than if you're um, running it counterclockwise. And then of course, speedometer gear, check it, make sure it's okay. Um, if you're just rebuilding the transmission in an otherwise stock application, in other words, it's going back into the same vehicle it came out of, and you're not modifying the uh, you know rest of the vehicle in any way, like you're not putting bigger tires on it or changing the gear ratio, then you can just, just inspect this, but otherwise you can leave it on. Um, no big deal. Now, if you want to take it off, um, you're going to need a puller of sorts. Uh, any kind of long two-jaw puller will work. Um, what I would recommend, though, is something that's designed for speedometer gear so you don't actually, you know, accidentally break it or damage it in any way. Um, and all you would do is press this down here, the little retainer clip in the front. Press that down with a screwdriver as you're pulling using the puller, and then it'll collapse underneath, and then the thing will come right off. All right, I'm going to take the governor out now. So I already talked a little bit about the governor. Um, some early models of TH350 did not have a retainer clip or the, you know, the case wasn't provisioned for it. So if yours doesn't have it, no big deal. You know, one other thing before we move to the governor uh, I should mention. Um, again, if this is a, a transmission that you're taking out of your vehicle, you want to inspect the slip yoke for any signs of uh, material transfer between it and the bushing. So in other words, if you see like a, you know, kind of bronze pattern that's kind of roughly in the shape of a bushing, uh, that would tell you that electrolysis is happening and electrolysis is an, ele is an electrochemical transfer material from, you know, one surface to another. And in this case, it would be the, uh, you know, uh, the extension housing bushing to the uh, slip yoke. And if that's happening, that would tell you that the vehicle's electrical system is grounding itself on the end of the drive line. Likewise, if you have um, a shirt to ground where um, you know you have like dimming every time you switch your you know you you switch gears in your uh, shifter, then that would tell you that the uh, system is grounding itself on the selector shaft. So. Um, if you think you have a, an electrical problem and it's associated with the transmission or, you know, transmission's um, operation is being compromised due to, you know, some sort of electrical uh, grounding concern, what you could do is go out to your vehicle, obviously transmission's still in it, um, leave your door open, stick the key into the uh, ignition, go key on, engine off, throw the thing in neutral, and then look at your dome light, okay, assuming your dome light's working. Um, then shift it into drive, to and low and watch that dome light. If that dome light is dimming every time you shift, then that tells you that the electrical system is grounding itself on the selector shaft. 
And then um, electrolysis could be a serious problem and damage internal hard parts. Uh, for example, in the 5R110s that use a, a wear plate in the pump, and this is Ford I'm talking about, uh, grounding issues can cause the pump gears to be welded to the wear plate, and obviously that destroys the pump and converter and, you know, puts the transmission and vehicle on the side of the road. So um, look for that on teardown, especially, like I said, if it's either, uh, especially if it's your vehicle, you're pulling your TH350 or TH400 out to rebuild or 700 or 4 whatever the case may be, um, you know, be on the lookout for that, especially if you've experienced some electrical issues. Okay, for the governor, um, what you want to do is take a flat blade screwdriver. Make sure there's no grooves in the uh, tip of the blade because that'll damage the cover. And then just carefully, you know, smartly tap onto it until you can get clearance between the uh, flange and the case. And then just go all the way around. Until the cover comes out or comes off rather. Okay, you're not gonna damage the cover by doing it this way. You just wanna make sure that you're not using a screwdriver that has a blade with, uh, you know, with grooves in it because then that's a good way to, uh, you know, to damage the inside of the cover to score it up and mar it up. Same deal here, look at your little seal, make sure it's not hardened, if it is then you'll, you'll have issues with the cover leaking. Check the little dimple here, make sure it's not damaged, make sure the crown of the cover is not dented in any material way. I mean if it was you would see the governor binding, so like for example when you had the cover still on and you're rotating the output shaft and you're watching the governor move with it, if the governor was binding up, you'd feel that and you can immediately look at the cover and if the cover was dented here, okay, then, well, you know you need a new cover. All right, governor should come right out. Main thing you want to look for in the governor is the valve. Okay, you see that valve moving nice and free? That's what you want to see. I mean, you can inspect the gears just purely from a diagnostic perspective. Uh, the little um, teeth here on the gear, if they are heavily worn or chipped or broken off entirely, then you'll have no upshift, okay? Uh, I will say, and I've said this in many other videos, but you know, I'll say here because it's important, don't think you can swap a 700R4 governor into a TH350 and it'll work because it won't. I mean, yeah, it might work, but your shift points are gonna be way off. Um, you can make it work, you know, you can make a 700R4 governor work in a TH350, but, you know, you're going to have to do a lot of modification to make that happen. And I only mention that because uh, both TH350 and 700R4 governors are getting very, very expensive, you know, for remanufactured ones. I remember as little as two years ago, I can go into my hard part supplier and um, purchase either a TH350, TH400, or 700R4 governor, brand new, uh, and spend about 40 bucks. Now I'm spending about 120 to 130. So uh, the best bet is to repair yours. Now if you're a governor, let's just say, let's just say you're a governor when you go and you know check movement in the valve, the valve wasn't moving at all, which is common. Um, what you wanna do is you wanna remove the uh, roll pin here and take the gear out and you can replace the gear at that point. Um, and then go up in here you're going to have to get, you know, some sort of punch or something to pry downward on the valve to get it out. Once it's out, again, use your bench buddy to polish the inside of the bore and then chuck the valve up in a drill, 800 or 1,000 grit sandpaper, polish it, and it should be fine at that point. All right. I'm going to pull out the... Uh, pressure taps, so they're all 7 sixteenths. And that just makes it easier to get everything in these uh, conduits cleaned up in the uh, jet wash.
They're all the exact same length, same dimension. You know, you can put them back in wherever. All right. I'm gonna flip this thing over and then we'll start, you know, taking stuff off the belly. Hey, like I said, there's a fair amount of water coming out of here and that's primarily due to the fact that when I pressure washed it, I masked off everything to the extent I could, but I think some water still got in there. All right, pan bolts are going to be half inch. A lot of RTV on this thing. Okay, so you're gonna try to pull this off and you're gonna discover it's damn near impossible. So what you wanna do is again take your uh, smooth blade flat screwdriver and you just wanna look for one of these bolt holes. I'll, I'll go for either here or here. And you wanna put your, um, your screwdriver right over a bolt hole location. You do not want to put it anywhere in between the bolt holes because you know, given the amount of RTV on this thing, it's going to take a little bit of effort to get it off. Uh, you don't want to risk denting or bending the uh, pan rail and the ceiling surface here, damaging it, because then it'll leak for sure. And then you're going to have to put just as much as R RTV back on when you go back with it and, you know, we'll replace the pans. So go ahead and go right here, you know, or here, it doesn't matter. And because if you bend this area here by the bolo location, then, I mean, that's no big deal because when you go to reinstall the bolt, it's going to flatten it right back out. Okay, I expect to see some water. And you also have a bunch of burnt clutch material. And look at the amount of RTV. I also do not see a magnet. So never, never put your uh, pan back on without a magnet. You don't want that you know, little fine metal particulate matter circulating freely throughout the transmission. And you wanna capture that crap and keep it where it's supposed to go. Okay, these bolts, which on TH350s, the non-locking variant, these are going to be um, flathead screwdrivers. So, you know, slotted, uh, you know, little screws on here are bolts. So three eighths. Okay, so this is the kind of filter you want to see on your TH350 and the kind you want to install. You never want to install that cloth style filters. Uh, those things are garbage. And they will cause all kind of problems when they get clogged and they tend to get clogged a lot more readily than your, um, you know, your screen style filters. All right, uh, there should be a gasket here. So one will come in the kit. All right, so now you have a good look at the valve body and uh, you know the uh, whole underside. You'll notice the presence of an auxiliary valve body where normally your um, your either channel plate or or hold down plate will be. I mean, it, don't get me wrong; it has a proper name. I just all annotate. 
Um, but what you have here is in this valve body your converter clutch control valve and that's this valve right here. And then you have your solenoid and your harness obviously and then you have your uh, high clutch pressure switch. So uh, this works like any other basic uh, electromechanical locking mechanism. Uh, once pressure is uh, detected in the high clutch and you're moving at highway speed, converter will lock. You know, in other words, a converter clutch will apply. Um, these were purely electromechanical initially, and then in, in the uh, early 80s, they went to um, a rudimentary computer. Uh, you know, they began to install rudimentary computers in vehicles that controlled the uh, converter lock-up solenoid. All right, let me clean up a little bit here, get all this, uh, you know, excess water and fluid and whatever out of the way, and then I'll resume. All right, so just pay close attention to the routing of your wiring harness. Um, you'll notice you got clips here, 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 here. Um, and that's it. So here, 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 and here. Just take a, a screwdriver and then kind of separate the two retainer tabs. All right, don't worry about breaking the case connector. It's no big deal. You're gonna replace it anyway. But the harness, if the harness is in good shape, there's nothing wrong with using it. So be careful when taking out the harness. All right, half inch. It's your detent roller, get that out of the way first. All right, if you reinstall your transmission and like it you know, only has one gear, no matter what you do with the column shifter, chances are the manual valve is not mated to the rooster comb via the S-Link. So if that's the case, or if it moves forward in reverse, let's just say, more than likely, this is not connected. So. No particular order in terms of valve body bolts that you need to be mindful of. You know, just take them out. In the case of a TH350, you're not going to have a wiring harness, obviously. So, use your screwdriver to carefully remove the, uh, you know, pressure switch connectors from the switch itself. And use your lock-up solenoid. Okay, notice these bolts are shorter than, than your regular valve body bolts. And that farting sound you hear is just air escaping from my glove. Okay, as far as the wiring harness and the solenoid itself, you just want to inspect this area down here, make sure that this has not become decoupled, make sure that this is still, you know, all one piece, so to speak. Uh, make sure there's no rust or no, you know, uh, other obvious signs of damage, electrolysis, what have you. Um, but other than that, like this one, for example, actually looks in good shape. So you can reuse this. It'll function as long as it's not damaged. And as long as there's no, um, no uh, areas where the wiring itself is exposed, you know, where the, uh, um, you know, where the rubber um, sheath, what I um, what word I'm looking for here, the insulation is not torn. Okay, so you got a few bolts here. Okay, again, same deal. You want to make note. These bolts are shorter, but otherwise all three of them are the same length and they are the same size as the bolts that hold down the, level, the plate that goes here on the non-locking TH350. 
So here's the auxiliary valve body. Again, if you're going to, you know, maintain this as a, uh, you know, um, a lockup setup, you're not going to convert it. Then you just want to check, make sure that the valve does move. You can probably use a thinner screwdriver, but or a pick, but you know you get the point. You're going to disassemble it anyway, and when it comes out, you're going to kind of feel for any dragging on that valve. You're going to check the spring, make sure the spring is not damaged. All right, rest of the valve body, same deal. You know, take all the bolts out, half inch. It is kind of heavy, so you know, just be careful with it. Okay, all these bolts are all exactly the same. So you just put them wherever. Now you got two more bolts here. It's for your hold down plate. And these bolts are going to be the same length as the bolts holding down the valve body, or the auxiliary valve body, excuse me. And there's that stupid sound again. Okay, it's got videos on the valve body. Main thing with the valve body is you want to make sure all those valve trains are moving freely. Um, check that before you take it apart. Also, check your a uh, little linkage arm here for your kick down. Make sure that it's not bent. Okay, um, this is going to be your 2-3 accumulator. This is going to be your kick down, and obviously that's your high clutch pressure switch, and of course your manual valve. Um, the valve trains in this valve body, compared to a uh, non-locking variant, <clears throat> are identical. Uh, this pressure switch here is primarily the only difference, um, you know, as far as visually or design-wise, but like all the valve trains function in the exact same way. All right, next examine your separator plate. You know, maybe bonded. The, the transmission is overheated. You'll have a situation like this where the gasket is coming off in pieces. So, you know, when you see that, you know, that's kind of a dead giveaway that there was an overheating condition or, you know, several episodes of severe overheating happened during the course of this thing's life while it was in the vehicle. And like I said, anytime you see like a lot of uh, evidence of overheating, severe overheating, etc. Uh, you really want to be wary of uh, the shape of the bell in the case. Make sure it's not warped, uh, especially with these older transmissions. Um, but I've seen it with uh, newer ones too, but I, it's more common with the older stuff. Okay, here is your, um, your manual band apply servo. Okay, it's got a Teflon sealing ring. Just replace it. You know, you don't have to inspect it. Uh, so the water here is your spring seat. goes like so. Get it off of there. Okay. So here it is. You have a little washer here. Make sure that washer is still there. And then your spring seat. And then your spring. Check balls. Uh, I have a video on TH350 check balls. Um, so 
The non-locking versions are going to have four check balls. The lock-up versions are going to have five. So let me wipe off my hands and then we'll zoom in so you can take a closer look. All right. So the difference is going to be this check ball right here. This is your converter clutch check ball. Uh, if you're converting to a non-lockup, you're going to leave this out. Okay, like I said, I'll get into much more detail in a separate video once everything here is cleaned up. But uh, suffice to say, if you're you know returning this to a stock configuration, or you're just you know you're not deviating from stock, then you want to put all your check balls back in. Uh, technically speaking, the TH350 only needs one check ball to operate, and here I'm talking about the non-locking version, uh, and that is the modulator check ball. Okay. So, modulator check ball is going to be right here, and the modulator valve and modulator complex is going to be right in here. So this has to be in there, otherwise you will have issues, but the rest of them you can leave out for firmer shifts. Okay, first go ahead and remove your parking pole guide plate, 9 16th. And if you wanted to get real technical, you can leave this on there if you want, but uh, you're going to run into problems with this thing interfering with the low reverse piston when you go to blow it out. So anyway, uh, 916 bolts on those. And you just pry up on your, your little spacer for your selector shaft. Get that out of the way. And then you're going to need an 11 16 wrench to deal with the nut. With the selector shaft, again, you want to check for hydrolysis. Make sure that um, <clears throat> you don't see any evidence of that. And what that might look like is either aluminum you know, material passing through here or any other signs that this thing has seen electrical current. You also want to check your threads on both ends. Uh, this is going to be the outside facing um, end, and then this is, of course, your inside facing. Just make sure they're not like, you know, damaged. All right, make note of the linkage and the way it is orientated, okay, particularly around here. So your parking rod is going to be situated right here in between these two stops on the rooster comb. Pretty basic deal. Uh, you may want to check the rivet too. Um, I've not ever seen a rivet bad, okay, um, but it, you know, it can happen. Um, what usually occurs is these will mushroom out and then this little parking rod actuator will become free of the rod itself and you'll lose the ability to put the vehicle in park. Again, it's not really something to be worried about with the TH350s. I see it on 6L80s from time to time. Uh, that's where you need to be concerned. Um, on those transmissions, you just want to replace the whole assembly with the updated version if you have uh, a transmission that's 2017 or older. Okay, Torilon check balls. It's always good to use them because they will not wear out the plate like the uh, the steel ones will. There's four that you would have in the non-locking version, and then here's the fifth for the converter. If this check ball is left out, you will not have converter lockup. So don't leave it out. Next you have two filters. This is going to be your pump filter. Now right, you always want to look at it and make sure that uh, if there is gunk in there you kind of see what it is and where it came from. You know when I say gunk I mean like metal pieces. Uh, regular gunk who cares it's you know just regular gunk. And then, of course, you have a little filter down here for the governor. This can be a pain to get out sometimes. OK, 
Okay, take note of it. A new one will come in the kit. Uh, if for whatever reason your kit does not have one of these, keep this aside and clean it up. Don't just throw it out because they can be reused. And same with the uh, filter for the pump. If for whatever reason your kit doesn't have one or it did and you lost it, you can reuse the old one as long as it's in good shape. All right, now we'll deal with the pump. Okay, so for the pump, easiest way to get the pump out once you have all the bolts removed is to thread in uh, two 3 8 by 16 bolts here and here um, in the threaded locations in the uh, pump itself, and then just use a slide hammer to wrap it out. Okay, 9 16 It would help if I took the bolt out. All the same length, they can go in whatever hole. All right, so grab your bolts that you kept aside from your extension housing. and then just thread them into the locations on the pump. They should go in by hand. If they don't, maybe just chase the threads. You don't want to obviously strip them. And then just thread them all in hand tight. That's sufficient. And then grab a slide hammer. And all you're going to do is just alternate one side and the other and wrap it out. Slide hammers are cheap. That one I think cost about 30 bucks. You know, for the whole kit, comes with a ver uh, you know variety of attachments. <clears throat> Got it on eBay. Um, you can get them at any local uh, you know auto parts store that sells tools. You know, it doesn't matter. It's a fairly simple deal. Okay. Before I disassemble this thing, I want to. Put it next to a uh, pump from a non-locking TH350 so you can see the difference. So if you're shopping for pumps, you know exactly what it is you're buying. The difference should already be obvious to you as far as the uh, height um, from the non-locking to the locking, but if not, all right, that should make it even more obvious. Uh, the non-locking variants are significantly taller, noticeably taller than the locking variants when put next to each other. These pumps are not interchangeable between um, the respective uh, case designs. In other words, you cannot just stick a non-locking pump onto a uh, <clears throat> into a TH350C without also swapping the uh, input shaft. The four drums are identical, but the input shafts are not. So if you're going to swap, you got to swap as a service pack, and that has to be done uh, as part and parcel for converting a uh, TH350C to a TH350. And there's no reason whatsoever um, you would swap in a pump from a locking uh, TH350, i.e. TH350C, into a non-locking variant. And then here are the drums. Okay, as you can see, you have significantly different um, 
shaft designs. This shaft is taller, much taller than that one. And I'll, um, I'll put them next to each other as well so you can, again, kind of look at that and know immediately um, the difference. But, it, you know, it's obvious. I mean, this is splined all the way to the top. That one's not. All right, now we're going to go ahead and take a closer look at the pump, pull it apart, inspect it, and I'll talk through some key differences through the years uh, with these pumps. Okay, all your TH350s are going to have generally the same architecture, um, however there are some um, component differences and changes throughout the years you need to be aware of. Uh, in 1975, they started installing uh, this metal sleeve here on the uh, pump stators, and this is called a steady rest. Uh, this was to promote better sealing and stability um, between the pump and the direct drum during operation. And what was happening in some of the earlier units prior to the installation of this is was uh, the pump and the drum, you know, the, the, the drum would cock sideways a little bit, uh, causing premature failure, uh, the sealing rings, and obviously, uh, you know, the clutch would uh, shortly follow thereafter. So you would have slipping, slipping or, or no, uh, you know, a neutral condition when shifting from two to three. Um, the other major difference is going to be the, um, the bearing. Uh, I believe in either 76 or 77 they started installing a Torrington bearing with a spacer uh, in place of the Babbitt style selective thrust washer that went here in the earlier models. Now you cannot interchange those two types of pumps directly without some machine work on the uh, earlier style. So in other words if you have an early TH350 and you want to adapt your pump to take a uh, bearing and a spacer, then what you would need to do is purchase the bearing and either the shim or spacer. Take that to your machinist along with the uh, Babbitt thrust washer on the uh, you know on the pump that came out of your early unit, and then um, have the machinist uh, machine this part of the stator here to accept, or excuse me, the pump cover. Uh, machine this part of the pump cover here to accept the bearing. Uh, without that machine procedure, you will not be able to um, simply, you know, retrospectively install a Torrington bearing equipped pump into a case that was set up for um, a pump that took a Babbitt thrust washer. Uh, the other change that was made uh, was the um, transition to Teflon scarf cut sealing rings. So. Uh, this coincided with a related change to the addition of a sealing ring down here at the very base of the stator. So early pump designs used um, only three sealing rings, the later pumps used four. And this was to also promote better sealing between the direct clutch drum and uh, the stator. All right, now if you happen to have um, a pump with an intact gasket. Uh, this one's mostly intact. I mean, it came out, <clears throat> uh, you know, ripped here, but just take a look at the gasket itself before you peel it away and see if there's any um, portions of the gasket that are blown out, uh, especially here down at the clutch feed circuits, because if you have a clutch failure, like direct clutch is all burnt up, um, you want to understand really why that happened. Um, I mean, there could be a myriad of reasons for it, but if you don't know or if it's, you know, you can't positively identify the cause, then, you know, it, it kind of leaves a little bit of area uncertainty when you go back with it. Uh, if you see any kind of blowouts here along the gasket, then at least you can say, okay, it looks like we had a gasket failure in this location. And you can tie that to a corresponding, you know, applied element in the case, if applicable, and at least be reasonably certain that you found you know, at least one significant cause of applied element failure. So your applied elements are your, uh, your three clutch packs uh, for forward, your low reverse pack, and your, uh, your intermediate braking band.
Okay, half inch for these bolts. All right, all the bolts are the same, same length. Here's your intermediate apply piston. So this particular uh, transmission was in behind either a V6 or a smaller V8, you know, smaller displacement V8. You know that because uh, this piston is gonna be significantly taller in height than the piston designed for the V8s. Um, additionally, you can just look in the case and you know, we'll show you in closer, um, closer up in a minute, but there's only two frictions and two steels in this transmission for the intermediate clutch valve. So the V8s all got uh, three frictions, three steels. So when I say V8s, I mean like your Chevy 350s and larger displacement Buick Oldsmobile and Pontiac variants. Okay, you want to check the lip seals, especially if you have a failure in the intermediate. Okay, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of places that can cause intermediate clutch failure. Uh, one of them is that um, one two accumulator piston, you know, worn uh, uh, worn Teflon sealing rings, um, you know, worn or cut lip seals is another um, proximate cause. And again, another sign of overheating is when you have to take a razor blade to separate the uh, pump to case gasket from the surface of the pump cover, and it's you know coming off in pieces. So I'm not going to bother with it now, but um, just to kind of illustrate it for you, you know, that's typical of an overheating scenario. All right, so with all pumps, you want to inspect the working surface. You want to make sure that it is free of any heavy scoring, gouging, or otherwise obvious damage to it. This one actually looks in decent shape. Okay, you want to do likewise with the piston pocket. Make sure that there's no burrs, no, um, you know, no scoring. Nothing that passed through here that would otherwise cut a lip seal on, you know, reassembly or during operation. Inspect the uh, journal itself, you know, along the stator. All right, make sure all these Teflon rings move freely, okay? If any of them are pinched, whether it be for the Ford or for the direct clutch rings, then you may need to replace uh, the stator. Likewise, check your splines. Make sure the splines themselves are not worn. Um, examples of worn splines would be instances where it's real, real thin, especially right here where it engages inside the converter. It gets real thin there. Okay, you don't want to see them, uh, you know, end up stripping out. You're going to do the same inspection procedure for your intermediate, or excuse me, your uh, input shaft. Splines there have to also be closely scrutinized pretty much in the same manner for the same reason. Um, bushings, you're going to replace all your bushings in the TH350. This transmission is hard on bushings. Um, these pump bushings here can get worn and cause drivability symptoms as well. Okay. All right, you can check into the bore you know, beyond the bushings, just the length of the bore, make sure that there's nothing unusual in there. You don't see any signs of cracking, fracturing, you know, any kind of damage that would suspect, or, or I should say, that would lead you to believe that this thing needs to be replaced. I mean, it's dirty, but it's gonna get cleaned. But from what I see so far, um, you know, this, this half so far, other than the gasket that's bonded to it, is, appears to be fine. I don't wanna say it is fine, but it appears to be fine. Uh, you truly won't know if you have a problem until it's all back together and you're doing air checks and maybe you notice something um, awry when you're trying to do the checks. But from what I see so far, this half looks okay. Okay, body. All right, very important. Uh, I mentioned this in my TH350 pump video, but 1978, uh, GM changed the bodies. They moved to a thicker gear. Okay, the thicker gear is uh, between eight 
141 and 846 thousandths thick um, prior gears from uh, 69 to 77 were 721 to 727 thousandths thick. So whatever you do, obviously don't mix match your gears with your uh, pumps. Okay. Take a closer look at these in a second. All right. Again, you notice here, obvious signs of overheating. Um, I'm thinking this thing ran low on fluid and it was leaking at the uh, pan. And as a result, it overheated multiple times. I would not reuse these gears for that reason alone. Uh, they are likely compromised. But what you would look for if you wanted to reuse your gears is just check the integrity of all of the teeth and then check out here on the outside di diameter. Make sure it's not heavily scored, cracked, broken, fractured, whatever. Um, and then for your, um, for your drive gear, you know, ditto, same thing. Okay. Um, some of these drive gears have a little index mark where you can readily tell which side should face up or face rearward. If not, you'll notice that there's an offset. So you see how there's a gap between uh, where the uh, lug stops and where the rest of the inner diameter continues. Okay, that offset has to be facing um, to the rear. So in other words, the little dot in this case will face up. But don't get married to the idea that there will always be an indexing mark because some gear sets and some transmissions have little dots or whatever uh, on both sides. Okay, the body itself, you got to scrutinize as well. Um, you want to make sure that this surface is perfectly flat. So sticking a straight edge on it with a feeler gauge will help you identify areas that may not be um, flat or maybe uh, you know high spots or whatever. Uh, that's always good to do, especially in the case of a transmission that overheated like this one. So, um, and then of course you want to check your clearance between your gears. Uh, you know the face of the drive and driven gear with the face of the body itself to make sure that they are also within spec. And I'll flash the specs on the screen. Um, I have several videos on checking pump clearance. Um, I think I have one for a TH400, but, uh, you know, the process is the same straight edge and feeler gauges. And then you mark where it's out of spec and then whatever the, you know, the largest, um, difference between spec and actual measurement is, uh, that's what you give to your machinist and then they'll cut it and then they will cut the pocket so that, uh, you have perfect clearance between the two faces, you know, faces of each gear and the face of the uh, pump body. Uh, you want to make sure you really inspect these crescents, both sides, okay? Um, especially in a high-performance application, if you have wear at the crescent, you're going to have um, fluid flow problems, volume delivery problems at uh, very high RPM under high power. So, you know, that could lead to, like, uh, slips at, you know, wide open throttle shifts from one to two, and especially from two to three. Uh, check your working surfaces. All right, this should be nice and smooth, no scoring. And, you know, from what I see, I don't see any evidence of, of any damage. So, um, and I always say, I mean, I'm doing this now just to show you, but uh, I, in, in the actuality, I don't really inspect or pay a whole lot of attention to these parts on teardown. Um, I inspect them when they're clean. When you have everything cleaned up on the bench, that's when you really do your inspection. And then afterward, if you're doing this for, you know, um, you know, uh, occupationally or whatever, you then can contact your customer and say, okay, you know, here are the parts that need to be replaced and what they're going to cost. It's uh, easy to miss something when you have parts that are all filthy and dirty, your hands are filthy and dirty, and, you know, some stuff could get overlooked. And, you know, <laughs> ask me how I know that. So, uh, anymore, I don't pay attention to these parts um, all that much unless it's like blindingly obvious that something's wrong. Um, I actually do my inspection after everything's cleaned up. Okay, pump O-ring, same deal if you have leaks, um, you know, in the outside perimeter or diameter, suspect the O-ring. Um, this one is like rock hard and it's coming off in sections.
Okay, you got uh, three different sections of pump o-ring. Okay, make sure you replace the uh, pump body bushing, obviously. And then the seal. Very early TH350, 69.70. Um, in this location right here, there was a um, something called a priming valve. And this was installed to, because uh, GM feared that there wasn't going to be enough pump pressure at startup, especially in cold weather conditions. Um, so they installed a priming valve to kind of aid in that. But after extensive testing that they did, um, 69 70, I believe in 71, they omitted it from the casting. So if you have one like that, and I have one, I think I showed um, in one of the videos, uh, you can put it back in or you can, you know, thread it with a... Uh, a tap and insert like a set screw in there. I mean, you, you, you know, you, or you can, I guess, JB weld over it. In other words, it's not necessary. So, you know, it's up to you how you want to handle it. All right, so that's the pump. Here's your intermediate return spring. Um, early ones, they, the springs were not captured on the uh, retainer plate. So, you know, they were loose. And then you had spring bosses. So, um, and that's kind of um, common throughout these units. You know, either you had early springs where the springs were loose and the pistons had spring bosses, or you had, uh, you know, later models with the um, captured springs. So, you don't want to mix and match the two. You want to keep like kind, otherwise they're interchangeable. You just want to make sure that you, you know, move them around. If you're going to go backwards and forwards, you move them as a service pack. And a service pack is just simply by definition um, a set of components that go together. All right, let's take a closer look at the intermediate clutch for drum, direct drum. Sometimes they get caught up, so I'll just take out the clutch first. So you have your cushion plate or wave plate, steel, and then this has two frictions, two steels. So, like I said, this is going to be um, representative of what you would find in a uh, either V6 or smaller V8 application, small displacement V8. You can easily add a third friction and steel to this clutch back by machining the piston. So your piston, you can just machine this down or install a V8 piston in there. You know, one that was designed to go with uh, three frictions, three steels. In real, real high horsepower, high performance applications, uh, or heavy, heavy duty towing and hauling, you can add a fourth clutch and steel. And that will uh, give you that much more holding power. I will say this, you really don't need to, um, unless you're doing something really wild and crazy. It's like, as far as upgrades go, it's probably the last on my list to do, uh, as far as, you know, is it mandatory or is it, you know, can you just like kind of leave it on the uh, cutting room floor, so to speak? Okay. All right, that was a little clumsy coming out, but you know, whatever. And it looks like uh, part of that was my um, selector shaft or rooster comb nut was maybe causing problems. Who knows? Okay, here, intermediate band. As you can see there's signs of, uh, you know, signs of overheating. This band was pretty burnt, or is pretty burnt. Uh, you would never reuse these bands. You would always replace them. Okay, you got a bearing. So it just goes like this. 
or like this. However, like when you're assembling it, I always just have it like that. All right, forward clutch. The drum itself never changed. Shafts are pressed into drums. So if you need and you have a non-locking uh, TH350 input shaft and you want to press it into the drum, you certainly can. So again, the difference is very obvious between uh, the TH350C's input shaft and the regular TH350. I mean, you'd have to be literally blind not to see or tell them apart. Alright, first we're going to look at the uh, forward drum. And like I said, I'll, maybe I'll just address it now. You want to make sure that you do a thorough inspection of these splines. I don't see TH350 splines um, stripped very often, in fact almost never, at least in the ones I've done. Um, I have seen many a 700R4 and 4L60E um, input shaft spline set heavily worn or partially stripped and in a few cases like fully stripped where there was literally nothing left. All right, this thing goes on the output shaft. Okay, earlier um, earlier units had that bronze bushing. That's always kind of a pain in the ass to remove. Okay, we'll have a look at our forwards. These look okay. This is a static clutch. Once it comes on, it does not come off unless you put the thing in park, reverse, or neutral. So you have your wave plate, and then this has four frictions, four steels. They look in good shape, and you can reuse the steels if they are, you know, if they look like these do. I mean, there's nothing wrong with these steels. All right, same with the backing plate or pressure plate. Check it, make sure that there's no signs of uh, heat damage. If you have a little bit of slip mark, you know, one or two slip marks, that's no big deal. You can take a wafer pad and an angle grinder and just buff them out. Um, what you really want to pay attention to is just the uh, structure itself. Make sure it's not cracked, right? You know, make sure it's not heavily worn on the lugs. And then if this area here is blued, you know, um, like I said, for overheating transmissions uh, or ones that slipped real bad, you want to make sure that you replace uh, the pressure plate or the backing plate, whatever you want to call it. Um, snap ring here, you know, go into the foot press, take it off. Pretty simple deal. You've seen that in other videos. Check your journal down here. Um, every once in a while I'll see one of these like really, you know, in real bad shape uh, due to either overheating or, um, you know, excessively worn bushings. Uh, this is a problematic area. Bushing likes to wear here, uh, you know, the rear stator bushings. And so you'll have issues with, um, you know, fluid blow by resulting in drivability symptoms if the bushings are not replaced. And of course, Check your, um, get the camera so you can see what I'm talking about. Check your torque converter lockup O-ring. This one is flattened and, you know, it's not rock hard, but it's certainly not supple. So uh, if you're having converter problems, this is a likely um, cause. Over time, they just get hard and, uh, you know, fluid blows by and, Converter clutch starts to slip, and next thing you know, the converter clutch burns up. All right, that's the forward drum. Again, uh, I'm not gonna bother taking the piston out. Um, well, you know what? Change my mind. I actually will because we want to inspect the uh, lip seal. So let me go to the foot press. I'll take it out, and then I'll be right back. And one thing I'll point out before I remove this is. You see these, uh, the two ends of the snap ring here? You want to make sure that they're actually situated between the locking bosses so that you have um, all points of the snap ring, all four locking bosses on the return spring engaged to the snap ring or with the snap ring. 
um, here it's kind of in between so um, not usually not the end of the world but it's just best practice to make sure that you have all four uh, locking bosses on any return spring assembly anywhere um, engaged on the snap ring Okay, check your return springs, make sure none of them are bent. I mean, that's almost never a problem, but just in case. All right, and you know, you probably already figured out by just looking at the clutch plates, um, you know, friction discs, and none of them are slipping, the steel are in perfect shape. And so the uh, lip seals must also be in good shape, and they are. All right, just check this area out in here. Uh, what you're really looking for inside the drum is any imperfections here on the inner journal surface where that uh, inner lip seal rides. All right, this seal here. Uh, you don't want any scoring. You don't want anything uh, that could cut a lip seal to be, uh, you know, to, to, to be present down there. Now you can add more frictions if you wanted to to this drum by machining the piston. Yeah, you really don't need to. I mean, four frictions for almost all applications other than the most, you know, ridiculous duty, uh, you know, or high performance, super ultra uber high performance situations. Four frictions, four steels is sufficient. The other thing you want to be real careful about is machining the piston too low. If you machine the height too low, such that, you know, either the, the cushion plate or one of the flat steels you know, is allowed to uh, is allowed to kind of go like that to slip in there underneath that ledge. Then you're going to have a no apply situation, and um, you know you're not going to go anywhere. So, like I said, it, you know, modification of the piston is really more uh, something that you see and want to do with the direct clutch than the forward clutch. I mean, you can do it in the forward clutch, but it's it's not nearly as critical. rearranging parts here on the bench to make space. And get this other stuff out of the way. All right, now we could talk about the direct clutch and direct clutch drum. All right, bushing must always be replaced. Okay, this bushing is worn out. Okay, check the uh, sealing surface in here. Again, you're looking for the same kind of things. You don't want to see instances where there's burrs or there's heavy wear, grooves cut into um, the locations where the sealing rings ride for the direct clutch. All right, let's take a look at the friction of the steels. And if you wanted to, you can machine the piston such that you can omit this wave plate or the cushion plate. Um, for forward, I would leave it in, but for the direct clutch, you know, especially in high performance, high uh, stall converters, you can dump it. All right, so we'll go here. So we have our direct clutch. You see slight slip marks uh, here on the steel. To be honest, it's not a huge deal. You can um, prep the steels and reuse them, but we do see signs of slippage and uh, overheating on the clutch plates. And this one's a little bit more severe. So again, it'll take a lot of prep work to get these cleaned up to where you can reuse the steels. And obviously you've never reused the clutches, but I mean, they're not 100% totally gone. And then your backing plate, your pressure plate, whatever you want to call it. This will also require prep work to reuse. Okay, we have some discoloration here. See that? Okay, that can be heat, could be electrolysis. So if you see that, and it's a transmission that came in for overhaul, you want to kind of question your customer or whoever owns the 
transmission or vehicle to see if they had any electrical problems or observed any issues with uh, their electrical system. And if so, then you want to make sure that they know to correct those before they put the transmission back in. All right, we'll go ahead and take out the um, return spring and we'll look at the piston and the pocket and then we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at the uh, intermediate sprag and I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of what you want to do on overhaul. All right, like the forward clutch before it, uh, the direct clutch return spring and snap ring was clocked such that the um, one of the ends of the snap ring was like kind of overlapping one of the locking bosses. So again, you want to avoid that on overhaul. You put it back together, and then your direct clutch piston. Okay, this is going to be your typical height piston. What you would see, direct clutch. We pulled out only three frictions, three steels. Okay, this is, tells me that this was a light duty application, V6 of some sort. For the record, I have no idea where it came from. <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about how to identify and uh, you know um, decode your TH350 based on the little sticker if it's there um, and what that alphanumeric code means and how you can tie it to a vehicle if it's, you know, a core or something you bought off Craigslist or whatever, you know, where you don't know where it came from. So, uh, this drum will be a candidate for adding an additional clutch and steel. So you would machine this down and all you would need to do is just take your, you know, friction and steel, a new one obviously, new friction and uh, steel plate, measure the thickness, and then start there, take that much off. Um, if you also wanted to omit the wave plate, um, as long as you had the room to do it before you got to the point where your, um, you know, your flat steel was sitting below this groove, then you can add maybe an additional um, steel plate as well. Otherwise, if you just wanted to go for friction for steels, omit the wave plate, then you would just simply machine the piston accordingly. All right, these lip seals are actually uh, fairly supple. Um, this was sealing okay. I think what was happening though is, like I said, low on fluid. Um, just based on the stress I'm seeing with all of these things, low fluid is the likely culprit here. I mean, low fluid will cause line pressure problems universally throughout the transmission. Uh, it'll also stress the gear train. Hopefully the, the, none of the gears are damaged, but we'll see. Okay, so here's your intermediate sprag, sprag rotation, free wheels counterclockwise, locks clockwise. Okay, and the reason why it, it uh, you know moves in this direction is because the direct drum faces this way in the case. All right, so looking at the case, direct drum is in there like that. Okay, now we'll take a look at the uh, intermediate sprag, <clears throat> and you notice here on the surface on the band where the band rides. Uh, a lot of slippage going on, so, you know, however this transmission was used, it was in uh, manual second a lot. So, uh, if you have a surface that looks like this, um, this is actually not that bad. A little bit of 400 grit sandpaper all the way around, just, you know, be real diligent, and that'll clean it up. If it's, like, burnt to where you see, like, blue and purple, and, like, it's, you know, just smoked or it's gouged or scored, then you want to either replace the drum or have it uh, remachined. And there's not a lot of material you can really take off here before your band clearance opens up too much. So um, when in doubt, I would say just replace it. These snap rings tend to want to pop out at real high RPMs, you know, high performance applications. So it's generally speaking a good idea to replace this traditional snap ring with a spiral lock ring, especially on high performance type situations because you don't want that obviously happening that'll destroy your intermediate sprag. Okay, and then the one thing that you want to do with all your TH350s, regardless of application, whether it's stock or high performance, at least this is my personal recommendation, is what I do, is you want to take this um, factory 
outer race and you know send it to the scrap yard and install a heavy duty race in its place and you always want to replace the um, one way roller clutch element itself with a new one okay um, they're fine the you know individual roller clutch elements for most applications but what usually happens is at high rpms especially when you have um, calibrated the shift profile the you know the one two shift to be real aggressive uh, this race will crack uh, it'll you know crack right in half and then of course you lose second gear and you know maybe other damage ensues um, if that happens to you uh, or if the sprag rolls over in other words the race doesn't crack but you suddenly have a neutral condition in second and that's due to the fact the sprag rolling or that I shouldn't say the sprag the uh, you know the roller clutch rolling over so where like you know when we were spinning it earlier it spins in both directions then you'll need to replace uh, the outer race anyway you don't have to replace the cam uh, this thing here you just want to check it you want to make sure it's okay if it is cracked then obviously you'd replace it but um, otherwise uh, if it's in good shape then you can reuse it Okay, same with the uh, retention plate. Make sure that there's no damage there. So, spiral lock ring for the um, snap ring. Replace the factory one and then replace the race with a heavy duty version. All right, let's get into the rest of the case. Take the gear train out. So, first you'll start with your front ring gear. So you may have a plastic thrust washer like this in the later units. The earlier ones generally will have Babbitt style thrust washers. Um, you know, no big deal. Just get the correct thrust washer for your application. Uh, for ring gears, just like, well, pretty much any other ring gear that you've ever seen me inspect, you're going to look at the whole body, make sure there's no cracks, right? You want to look at the lugs, make sure the lugs are in good shape, make sure there's not any unusual wear. Uh, you also want to make sure that the surface here um, you know, for your bearing is in good shape. Uh, the bushing you're going to replace. The teeth must also not show uh, or exhibit any kind of uh, excessive wear or cracking or chipping or whatever. Um, you know, kind of common sense stuff, really. So, all right. Now the planet is being held in place by a snap ring, so it's just a you know little one. So you're going to need some um, snap ring pliers, 90 degrees. And then you just got to find the ends, get up in there, and we just get it started so you can take it out. This could be a little stubborn, especially if you're trying to film a video and you're trying to show people how to do it. Now, they don't want to fight you. Hey, real stubborn. Just check it. Um, if you struggle with it like I just did, you want to make sure you didn't bend it or break it. Um, I'll probably, if I was to put this back together, I would replace that snap ring. Okay, just pull your planet out. So, if you have a uh, planet that takes a bearing like this, or you're working on an early unit that uh, had the front planet that took the thrust washer, uh, you can retro back a uh, bearing equipped planet as long as you retro both the planet and the bearing. Um, you can't have one without the other. So, and I guess if you had to, you can prospectively install an earlier planet with a thrust washer into a TH350C or later TH350 that took a bearing. Why you want to, I would not, you know, I would have no idea, but um, maybe you were just in a pinch and that's all you had. So check your captured bearing. If this bearing is no good, if it feels like there's sand in there or whatever, then the whole thing will have to be replaced or rebuilt. Um, you can rebuild these. Uh, you just press the uh, pinions out, 
put new needle bearings in, uh, new little thrust washers there for each of the pinions, and then put a, a, a good used bearing or a new bearing. Okay, otherwise just check all your surfaces, your splines, your journal here, okay? And then for planets, uh, you know, the pinion gears themselves, check them for side play. And then check for vertical play. Okay, each of these has a spec. I don't know what this one is offhand. If I can find it, I'll annotate the video with it. But um, that's that's how you would check. If it has a, an, you know, an excessive amount of play vertically, like this one is kind of bordering on, uh, you know, where I might be concerned about it, then you're either going to want to rebuild or replace the planet. If you have a situation where um, an overheating episode occurred at the planet, you might notice some bluing in this area on these uh, pinions on either side, uh, but especially the, um, uh, you know, this side, the uh, rear facing side. <clears throat> if that is the case, I would just replace the whole thing. I wouldn't reuse it. Not all that common, but it does happen. Okay, here's that uh, little seal that seals off the junction between the input and the output shaft. Again, uh, these are more common in the late model units earlier. Uh, they had that, um, you know, bushing. And that bushing is kind of a pain to get out. Uh, there are some models that have um, uh, nothing there, and they take like a Teflon seal on the input shaft. All right, next is the Sun Shell. Sun Shell is going to feature a thrust washer, much like the uh, 700R4 4L60. Um, same principle. So it uh, serves as a surface for the sun gear, excuse me, sun shell to thrust against the center support with. Sun shells are usually not in bad shape. Uh, you want to check these lugs for wear. Um, if they're real worn, it'll be a very noisy unit. So if they're excessively worn, just replace it. Um, for the sun gear, you're going to replace the bushings. So uh, there's a bushing here and then a bushing on the front. So. Yeah, just replace them, and then you want to check your teeth. Make sure there's nothing unusual going on with the teeth, no excessive wear. Uh, you may notice on real high performance uh, type builds, uh, the retainers, or little retaining rings rather, are um, tack welded, and you know, they, they're tack welded for that, uh, you know, so that they don't come out. Um, it's not, it's not very often at all that you see one of these retention rings broken, uh, you know, retention snap rings. But, um, you know, if you do, it's usually because the vehicle was in a uh, high-performance application or used as if it was built for high-performance. But um, if you see that, then you may want to reinforce this area there. Otherwise, inspection is fairly straightforward. Like I said, just make sure everything is okay. No scoring, no burnt, uh, you know, signs of heat damage, no chipped teeth um, on either sun gear. Um, this is, you know, what we would refer to as a compound sun gear. It has a, you know, sun gear for the front planet and a sun gear for the rear planet. You know, pretty straightforward deal otherwise. Um, you'll see this in my build-up video for this transmission. Well, not this transmission in particular, but the TH350. Um, you can run a uh, <clears throat> what's called a Vega sun shell. It's a ventilated sun shell where the um, you know the body has you know large holes cut in it in this region here. So some people might tell you that those sun shells are weak and they won't stand up to performance, but I found that not to be true. Um, I mean they're really no different in terms of their strength uh, compared to their um, I guess unventilated cousins. So having the big cutouts along the body help allow fluid in the case to move between the front gear train and the rear gear train and center support and particularly extra lube for the low roller clutch which in these transmissions is actually a fairly common um, failure point. So um, a simple upgrade you can do, and again, if you're watching any of my other TH350 videos on the rebuilds, uh, I installed a 4L60E center support and new low roller clutch. Uh, that is a drop-in deal, no modification necessary, and it basically eliminates 
a, um, a common failure point, especially in high-performance applications where there's going to be a lot of power on takeoff. Um, the low roller only holds in first gear. After that, it, you know, it's not doing anything. So <clears throat> it's something to keep in mind. So I have, a, again, a whole video on, like, you know, tips and tricks for um, I mean, beefing up your TH350 on a budget, but that's one one recommendation I would make in addition to the uh, in addition to upgrading your intermediate outer sprag race or roller clutch race. Alright, next we're gonna deal with the center support. So you've seen me use this uh, this screwdriver before, long screwdriver, little notch cut in it for snap rings. All right. Sometimes you can force it out just by mashing on the uh, output shaft. Sometimes you have to tap it out. This one was of the latter variety. Alright, so just reach in and do the best you can to take hold of everything. Like I said, if you, if you removed your uh, speedometer gear, everything would come right out. Alright, so here's the uh, center support. It's a TH350 variety. Uh, if this was purely a stock rebuild, in other words, it's going to be put back in and the vehicle itself is stock, same vehicle it came out of, then uh, as long as it was in good shape, you can reuse it. Uh, what you want to do is you want to replace this uh, low roller assembly itself uh, with a brand new one. But for anything performance, you want to get rid of this thing and you want to install a late 700R4 or 4L60E um, center support assembly. So check your inner race. It should have a mirrory smooth finish. Should not be cracked. There should not be scoring. Okay, make sure that these lugs are in good shape. They're excessively worn. You'll have issues um, with the rear planet because the rear planet goes there. excessively rattled and, you know that's kind of exaggerated if this was to be put back in you wouldn't have that you know that noise or anything all right um, apply surface just make sure it's not burnt not blued um, unless there's some sort of significant issue with the um, with the uh, sealing rings or lip seals rather on the low reverse piston, you're usually not going to have a problem. Um, you know, you may also see issues with that if there's a uh, lubrication failure inside the uh, rear gear train, you know, restrictions in the system, etc. All right, let me get this stuff out of the way. So, like I said, um, well, check this. Make sure it's not cracked. If it's okay to reuse, you can reuse it. If not, replace it. Same with this thing. Um, this is what I was actually initially referring to uh, when I you know, said, like I said, uh, replace this if it's tough coming out and you got to really bend it or contort it to get it out. Bearings. This is true of all of them. Just check them. Make sure that they're spinning freely and smooth. They're not making any kind of noises. If they are, just replace them. All right. So here's our rear planet. Looks like a smaller version of that, which you would find in a 700R4 or 4L60E. And believe it or not, um, there is a way you can retro a 700R4 or 4L60E rear planet into a TH350, though it does require um, you know, some modification of the, you know, of the ladder. Or I should say of the former. Yeah. Pull the 
clutch out. Okay, these do not use any kind of cushion plate. So, you know, if you don't see one, then, you know, know that that's correct. You got a bearing. Okay, this is the side that faces front, and then the outer portion of the bearing faces the uh, ring gear. All right, and then there is a snap ring that holds the rear wheel here to the output shaft. So unlike a uh, 700R4-4L60E, um, you will need to remove that snap ring unless, like I said, you um, take off the drive gear on the output shaft on the other side of the case so that you can just pull everything out. But if you did not do that like I didn't, then you're going to need to remove the snap ring. And the snap ring is, you know, right down here. Kind of tricky to see it. Okay, same deals the other one if it's you know, kind of funky looking or you think you may have bent it or whatever, just replace it. Okay, then you have your ring gear. Same deal. You're gonna inspect all the surfaces, the splines, the teeth, the lugs, the journal. Uh, this area here where the bearing goes. So, your case bearing, your rear thrust, goes on like this. And you have your case saver, or I should say anti-clunk spring. You can put a case saver uh, into these things. Um, I think on my rebuild I did, it was a more of a performance deal. Output shift, you're gonna check splines, you're gonna check journals. Uh, you wanna check the rear splines too, make sure they're okay. Um, just make sure that there's no damage to it in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you want to check the uh, worm gear uh, tracks here for the governor. Make sure that there's no burrs, anything that could cut that um, plastic tooth on the uh, governor. And um, the only thing left in the case is going to be our low reverse piston. So. Low reverse piston has a snap ring. So you gotta take that out. You gotta use a tool to compress the snap ring. I'll do that in a second. First, we'll take a look at the clutch. So you got four frictions, four steels. Again, no wave plate. This clutch looks in decent shape. It's not common that I would see these, you know, bad. Uh, another upgrade that uh, you can do, it's relatively cheap, is install tubular steels from a uh, 97 and up 4L60E for the low reverse. You just want to double check the thickness, make sure that the uh, thickness of steel that came out of the uh, TH350 is the same as the uh, 4L60E. And you also want to check thickness of friction disc too. You want to make sure that um, you don't come out of clearance if you decide to swap in different parts. <clears throat> All right. Let's see if we can compress a little reverse. This is 
marginally too wide. So I'm gonna try this one. Okay, the end of the snap ring here, roughly at the two o'clock position as you're looking at it, so I gotta make sure I have access to it. This and that um, ring gear, the output shaft snap ring, both can be kind of a pain to get out. You know, it might take you a little bit to get to it and free it up. Pressed it a little too far, and the pliers were actually going underneath the two ends of the snap ring, so hence the delay. Now, sometimes the snap ring, um, you know, will come out fine, but the return spring will stay in there like that. If that happens, just take your screwdriver and kind of punch at it, and then that'll free it up. So just double check, make sure that uh, you know none of the springs are damaged in any way um, you know some of these models you won't have all the springs in the uh, you know on the spring retainer that's normal all right I'm gonna turn the uh, air compressor on and then we'll apply uh, compressed air into the lower reverse feed port the bottom of the case and that will um, free up the uh, lower reverse piston and you know have it fall down on the bench All right, gonna turn the case vertical. And what you're gonna wanna do is just simply introduce air into the low reverse clutch. And that will allow you to remove the piston. All right, so like everything else, um, you know, lip seal or sealing ring wise, you want to inspect the lip seals here on the piston, especially if you uh, had issues in reverse. So these should be nice, soft, and supple. And uh, I don't know if that's the case with these. It doesn't quite feel that way. Okay, this inner one is hard. Um, if you're going to have problems in low reverse with these uh, sealing rings or lip seals, um, they're really not technically lip seals, they're actually square cut or deep cut seals. Uh, it's going to be the um, typically in the middle, uh, you know, this center o-ring here, you know, o-ring in the center of the piston. Um, it looks like all three of these are rock hard though. And they can be kind of a pain to get out when they're like this. I mean, look at that. Now these seals can be in this condition for any number of reasons. This thing could have been sitting for God knows how long in the desert, 
you know, outside exposed to the elements, seals and ceiling rings, O-rings all dry rotted. Um, that's not entirely uncommon or unheard of. But if you have a clutch pack that has burned, you want to make sure that you determine to a high degree of certainty why it burned. You want to identify the proximate cause. The root cause can be anything. I mean, it could be lack of maintenance, it could be abuse, it could be misassembly, uh, you know, I mean, there could be any number of things, but, you know, the proximate cause is going to be more important from a rebuilder's perspective because that at least will tell you why um, a given applied element or, you know, uh, one-way clutch or hard part failed inside the unit. You know, because if you don't know why something happened, you don't know why a particular uh, clutch failed or, you know, whatever happened, you don't know why it happened or the evidence isn't uh, sufficient to make a reasonably confident diagnosis, then, you know, in a way it kind of puts you at a little bit of a disadvantage because you don't know if there's something maybe wrong with the case or there's something else going on that you're just not seeing and you know the real fear that I'm talking about here is having the unit come back because it failed shortly after it went back on the road. Okay, case connector. You could reuse these if you can get them out in one piece. Um, I typically don't make any effort to do this. Uh, I kind of will with this one just to show you, but you know, just do the best you can to collapse it. You know, push, collapse the two retaining tabs, one on each side, inward, and push it through. All right, this one's just dirty, but it otherwise appears to be in good shape. If for whatever reason you don't have access to a new one, then you can certainly reuse that, you know, pre-existing one. You just want to make sure that you don't damage it. Try to take it out and don't put it through the jet wash either. All right, so that's the TH350 teardown. Um, if we were going to overhaul this unit, we would do a paper and rubber kit, complete clutch module, a direct clutch steel module. Um, I could probably reuse the pressure plate and direct clutch without too much fear of anything. Uh, I would machine the direct clutch piston to allow for an additional steel and clutch. Um, same with the intermediate clutch, I would add an additional friction and steel either by swapping to a V8 piston or simply machining the one I already have. Um, pump, we would purchase a new set of gears and then hopefully uh, achieve proper clearance with the new set without having to resort to machining the pump body. If you do have to machine the pump body for one of these transmissions or TH400s or anything with a crescent, you're going to need to have it done on a vertical end mill. Um, you cannot just stick this on a lathe because you have an offset here and that offset due to the crescent um, pretty much forces you to use a mill to cut the pocket to uh, the proper depth. All right, I would also get a uh, Sonics heavy duty outer um, intermediate outer roller clutch race. Uh, those are always preferable. You don't really want to ever use or reuse the, the factory piece. Uh, all the bearings are in good shape. All the thrust washers are in good shape. Um, what else? Uh, governor. Probably go through the governor even though it seemed to check good. We would clean it out, take the valve out, inspect it, make sure it's okay. I have a video on how to do that on either this transmission or the 700R4. Um, and then uh, as far as drive and driven gear, assuming that uh, it would go back into the same vehicle came out of, you know, we would just reuse them. I'm trying to think what else. Um, new 1-2 uh, accumulator piston uh, return spring. So never reuse that. Always put a new one in there. Um, spider lock for the uh, intermediate roller clutch. You know, I would not reuse the factory uh, factory snap ring and then the two little snap rings uh, one for the front planet 2 output shaft and one for the rear ring gear to output shaft I would replace those 
Um, you may say that that's not necessary. I'm being a little paranoid, and you know, you're probably right, but I'd still replace them because both of them were tough coming out, and that's 100%, you know, operator error there. Um, can't really blame anybody but myself for that one. Um, let's see, Sun Gear, uh, the Sun Gear shell looks good. It's got a slight, you know, slight bit of wear to it, but I don't think anything severe enough to wear require replacement. Um, but you can always take a closer look. You know, just again, look at the uh, lugs here. I mean, there's a little bit of wear here on this one. If you see a shiny spot, um, this one would be a judgment call. I'd have to really think about it. Um, the race looks good, me dropping it notwithstanding. And then uh, I think everything else looks okay. Uh, if we were going to reuse this case, we would have to weld repair the flange, um, you know, on that uh, driver's side there and make sure that it 100% bolted back up to the engine, flush and true all the way around, that it was not warped. Um, but other than that, um, you know, I think we're in good shape. Uh, we would want to check the pan, make sure that the pan itself isn't warped. If it is, we'd put an aluminum pan on it. All right. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions, comments, go ahead and leave them below. Um, I'll annotate the video where if there's anything important that I didn't, you know, verbally touch on. Uh, if there is um, appetite or a desire to see a video on vacuum modulators and the modulator system in general, let me know on that and I'll do one. Um, but otherwise, uh, I think I've covered the TH350, uh, you know, as thoroughly and as comprehensively as I'm going to. So uh, if you have any questions, like I said, just go ahead and leave them in the comments and I'll respond back as soon as I can. Thank you again for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening.